This woman claimed she was being arrested for being too pretty. She's now being convicted of murder. Hend Bustami is a 29 year old woman from Las Vegas. In 2022, she was arrested at Harry Reid International Airport after leaving a restaurant without paying. When she was arrested, she told people that she was being harassed by police because they'd never seen anybody as pretty as her. She was apparently intoxicated at the time. She told them she was gonna spit on them and she accused them of trying to R her. A few months later, she was arrested for a far more hideous crime. Dispatchers received a 911 call from her on the 26th of October, 2022. It was around 2.30 a.m. She stated, I think I killed my mummy, and she was referring to her 61-year-old mother. Her mum was Afaf Hassanan. She admitted on the call to breaking a glass table over her mum's head. She stated on the phone to the dispatcher, I broke the table on her head and I cut her neck off. Officers found the killer in California covered in blood. Her mum's body was at her home in Vegas. Hen stated that the pair had had an argument over cigarettes and it had escalated. She was charged with second degree murder with a deadly weapon, but she pleaded guilty but mentally ill. She was eventually sentenced to 15 years in prison. This is one of the most gruesome and tragic workplace accidents, so you might want to hear this. In October 2012, a 62 year old employee at Bumblebee Foods named Jose Molina was having a normal day in the Bumblebee facility in California. In his schedule, Jose was tasked with performance maintenance on a 11 meter long industrial oven so he went inside on one of the oven tanks. Believing that Jose was in the bathroom, one of his co-workers actually shut the tank's door and then filled the entire oven with 5,400 kilograms of tuna and then turned the oven on. A search ensued when the manager noticed Jose was missing, but by then it was way too late. They found Jose's body two hours later inside of the oven. The temperature inside the oven reached 270 degrees Fahrenheit and Jose was unfortunately cooked alive inside of the tank with all of the fish. And you can only imagine how horrific this death actually was. Could you imagine just being cooked alive and then being crushed by tens to hundreds of pounds of fish? Mixed with the smell, the texture, the heat, this death was just awful. The company Bumblebee and two managers were actually charged for this death, and the company got off with a $6 million settlement. But what do you think? Do you think 6 million is way too low for a death like this and accident? Many people believe it should have been more towards 50 million. But yeah, this death is absolutely awful and I can't believe this happened to poor Jose. This man murdered his wife and three children before turning the gun on himself. He survived his attempt to take his own life and this is the mugshot that came out of this. Meet Charles Robert Gillard Sr. In May of 2022, Charles snapped. At the end of May in 2022, at around 2.30 p.m., the police were called to this residence in Michigan. When they arrived, they were met with an extremely gruesome scene. They found the bodies of a mother, a father, and three children. All had been shot, and nobody had any idea what had happened. The children were identified as Ronald Joshua and Don Gillard. They were only three, four, and six years old. And the woman whose body they found was 40-year-old Don Gillard. The first responders who responded to this crime scene have gone on the record and stated that it was the most gruesome thing they'd ever come across. The first responders, in fact, had no words to offer upon seeing the scene. It was truly unlike anything they had ever witnessed. So I haven't been able to find any more information about what exactly led up to this incident, but it's known that on that day, Charles Gillard took a gun, murdered his wife and three children, and then tried to take his own life but failed miserably. He survived his own unaliving attempt, spent weeks in the hospital recovering, and now he's going to prison. I'm honestly glad he lived so that he could be sent to prison because this man really, really needs to suffer. This shocking crime case is so concerning because it could happen to anyone. It was August 2022 and Stephen Marlowe was living in Butler Township, Ohio. On the 5th of the month, he posted a rambling video to social media after allegedly murdering four of his neighbors. He stated in the video that he would be killing more people too. He spoke of how he believed that he and his family were victims of mind control experiments. He stated that their thoughts were not private and that, quote, it's cruel and it's wrong. Victims included elderly couple Clyde and Eva Knox, who had been married for 60 years. Police were called initially to the scene after people had heard gunfire. Officers discovered the couple deceased in their home. 
Then they made another shocking discovery. Sarah Anderson, aged 41, was also deceased inside her home. Her body was found alongside the body of her 15-year-old daughter, Kayla, and they had both been shot. Stephen was tracked down and was arrested the following day in Kansas. He told officers that he was a victim of mind control and he called himself a targeted individual. Now, this is a term used by people who believe that a microchip is implanted into their brains. He accused his neighbours of being attackers who were influencing his thoughts telepathically. He said he was sacrificing himself to help to expose this. Despite being charged with four counts of murder, he was ruled currently incompetent to stand trial, much to the frustration of the victim's families. This mother killed her three-year-old daughter because SpongeBob SquarePants told her to. If you've never heard about this, you might want to. On September 17th, 2022 in Michigan, a police officer named Gerald Soboleski received a call from a man inside his sister's residence claiming that he found a human foot. So the officer then immediately drove to the residence and when checking the back room, he found two garbage bags with one of them having a human foot sticking out of it. And unfortunately in one of the bags was the body of three-year-old daughter Sutton Moser, who was stabbed multiple times before being stuffed into the bag. Police immediately got a search team together to find Sutton's mother and eventually they did find her and she was passed out in a random graveyard. Turns out the 22-year-old mother named Justine Johnson was the culprit who stabbed and murdered her three-year-old daughter and was therefore immediately arrested by the police. When asked why she did it, it was later revealed that she was experiencing hallucinations from heroin withdrawals and not sleeping for approximately two weeks. So on the day of Sutton's murder on September 16th, 2022, Justine was hallucinating while watching Spongebob Squarepants, who apparently instructed her to kill and take her daughter's life. She also said that if she didn't do what she did to her daughter that they would kill her, and said she was afraid for her life and lost her mind. This case is just shocking and absolutely disturbing, and how could Spongebob convince you to kill your own daughter? I guess she was hallucinating, but still, this is just absolutely crazy to wrap your head around. Rest in peace to Sutton, you did not deserve this at all. So you will probably not be able to fly again after watching Society of the Snow. The movie is based on the real-life plane crash that left a rugby team stranded in the Andes Mountains for 72 days, forcing some of them to consume the victims of the crash to stay alive. But I want to talk about the plane crash scene because there are a lot of little details in it that are terrifyingly accurate to what really happened. And as a quick reminder, I have a podcast of horrors, hauntings, and mysteries if you want more crazy stories. So on Friday the 13th in October of 1971, a team of rugby players boarded a flight in Uruguay that was headed to Chile, but they were going over the Andes Mountains, so they had to go south, over, and up to Santiago. As one character explains in the movies, the Andes also have these cold fronts that will suck planes down out of the sky. Also, that day was really cloudy, and one thing the movie doesn't describe is the pilot turned too early and got lost. So the pilot thought that he was over there, so he started descending because he thought he was in Santiago. But when they got out of the clouds and everyone looked outside, the mountain was like 10 feet away. The pilots had to think really fast and basically pull the plane up almost vertical to not hit the mountain. But they didn't do it in time and that's where the tail of the plane clips the mountain top. And the force from that sucked five people out of the back immediately. And this is exactly how it goes in the movie. The rest of the fuselage cascades down the mountain until it finally stops and crushes everyone into each other, killing the pilot in front. And actually a devastating tidbit that the movie doesn't show is that one of the pilots ended up surviving for the first night. And before he died, he actually told the team where they were in the Andes to help them be rescued. But because he had been lost while flying, he told them the wrong location, which completely messed up their rescue plan and they were stuck there for almost two and a half months. Anyways, if you have a strong stomach, you gotta watch the movie. What this woman did still leaves locals speechless 65 years later. In the small town of Goobersville, Indiana, in the year 1957, a chilling incident unfolded. Karen Noodleman, a 16-year-old girl with a haunting past, resided in an insane asylum. Known for causing the tragic loss of her family members, she was deemed dangerous after a lobotomy gone wrong when she was just 13. One eerie night, during the routine morning roll count, Karen was nowhere to be found in her cell. Panic ensued as the asylum doctors discovered a hidden hole behind her Marilyn Monroe poster. The entire facility went on high alert and the police were immediately notified. Concern for the safety of Karen's remaining family members grew, particularly her younger brother, who was living with their grandparents. Multiple attempts to reach out to her grandparents went unanswered, 
deepening the sense of unease among the asylum staff and law enforcement. With a sense of urgency, the authorities rushed to Karen's grandparents' home. They pounded on the front door, yelling, police! Uncertain of what they would find inside, someone finally opened the door, but it wasn't who they expected. This is the love triangle that ended in a Valentine's Eve murder. Louise Grieve was a 38-year-old woman from Hook Norton in Oxfordshire. She'd been in a relationship with Keith Green for eight years. Keith was a happy-go-lucky and kind-natured man. He was described as a genuine person who loved his children dearly. Behind closed doors, Louise was being unfaithful to him. She'd been seeing 25-year-old Mark Meadows and had been for around 12 months. Now, things had been bubbling under the surface and Mark had been getting increasingly jealous of Keith. It was the 13th of February 2022 and Louise was in her local pub playing bingo with Mark and his half-brother. His half-brother was Travis Gorton, age 20. When they left, they decided to go to Keith's house. Louise callously let the two men into the garden and they waited for her as she knocked the door. As Keith stepped outside of the property, the pair launched a vicious attack. They used two knives to stab him over eight times, killing him. After fleeing, one of the pair dropped the knife down a nearby drain and the other hid the other knife inside of a speaker. Mark also accidentally dropped his mobile phone at the scene of the crime in the frenzy, leading police directly to him. It also provided them with valuable evidence in the form of incriminating plans to get rid of Keith. Police acted fast and arrested Mark just an hour after the murder. The men were both given a life sentence each in court and Louise was charged with manslaughter. She was given just eight years. A teenage girl was apparently also involved but has to remain anonymous due to legal reasons and she was convicted of manslaughter. The judge addressed Louise in court and stated, you did nothing to resolve a tense and dangerous situation between the two men in your life because you were enjoying the situation of two men vying for your attention. Two other 10 year olds I don't even know kidnapped, tortured and murdered me. My name is James Patrick Bulger. I was two years old and died on February 12th, 1983. My mother Denise Fergus and I were out shopping that day. While we were in the aisles of the store, my mother let go of my hand for a very brief moment. Due to a slight lack of attention on her part, she noticed that I had disappeared. Then our two 10-year-olds, Robert Thompson and John Venables, came up to me and took me by the hand. Because of my young age, I didn't understand what was happening. Several people must have seen the scene, but no one reacted when I was kidnapped. They took me to a railroad track where there was no one around. They started beating me and allowed all the atrocities they did to me. They threw bricks and rocks at me. They also hit me on the head with an iron bar. And worst of all, they put batteries in my mouth. Then they asked me to undress so they could hit my private parts and inserted objects into my anus. After they'd finished playing with me, they placed me on the railroad tracks so that a train would run over me and make it all look like an accident. The two boys who assaulted me were convicted of murder in 1993 and sentenced to indefinite detention. They were released under new identities as adults. Do you think their judgments were correct? This has got to be one of the most horrific recent cases that I've come across. As you can see, it does involve a very young baby, so if you think it might be triggering, please do scroll. This is baby Zariah. She was born just last month and last Friday she passed away in the most horrific circumstances. This is Zariah's mother, Mariah Thomas. She's 26 and she's now facing 10 to 30 years in prison over the death of her daughter. Prior to being pregnant with Zariah, Mariah was taking medication for her mental health. She stopped taking this medication when she became pregnant and according to a friend, she recently asked her if she'd started taking her medication again and she laughed and said no. She'd also recently expressed on Facebook that people were only interested in seeing her because she'd just had a baby. Her friend has also said that she was a fantastic mother and that she would never hurt her daughter on purpose. They both lived with Mariah's parents, but on this fateful day last Friday, both parents were out of the house, leaving Mariah and Zariah alone. Mariah's dad received a phone call from a hysterical Mariah, saying that she'd meant to put baby Zariah down for a nap, but instead she'd somehow placed her in the oven. When emergency services arrived at the house, they found Zariah in a car seat by the front door. She was already clearly deceased. Her clothes were melted, as was her diaper, and she had severe burns. 
Mariah told the police exactly what she told her father. She meant to put the baby down for a nap in her crib, but somehow she'd placed her in the oven instead and switched it on. Mariah was arrested on Friday and is now facing a Class A felony of endangering the welfare of a child in the first degree, resulting in death. She's facing 10 to 30 years in prison. This is one of the craziest urban legends I've ever heard, and it ended up being true. So almost 100 years ago, there was an aquarium in Australia that had a giant tiger shark on display. And the legend goes that one day in front of like groups of families, the shark threw up a human arm. And not only is that true, but it opened a murder investigation. Also, this week's episode is all about Australian true urban legends, so make sure you listen. So after the shark threw up the human arm, the police had to figure out whose it was and why it was in the shark's belly. Well, the first thing the police noticed was the arm was cut cleanly, not jagged like it was from a shark bite, meaning that the arm was intentionally cut. So now it's clear that this was a murder, but whose arm is it? Well, one thing they noticed is that the arm has two boxers in a fighting stance tattooed on it. So they end up writing about that in the paper and one guy who was reading it goes, hey, that sounds like my brother's tattoo. His brother was a man named Jim Smith and he was involved in the seedy underbelly of Sydney society. Jimmy ran insurance fraud scams in Sydney and he was just involved with a lot of bad people. And the last person he was seen with was one of Sydney's most notorious criminals. The story has a lot of twists, including how was he involved with the last guy he was seen with. And there's a lot of fun Australian urban legends like the story of the button man. So make sure you check out this week's episode. This man was interrogated by police for six hours before they realised he'd been shot in the head. It was Christmas Day 2006 and Ryan Waller had been living with his girlfriend Heather Quinn in Phoenix. The pair were preparing for festivities together and they were planning on heading to Ryan's dad's house to celebrate Christmas when the doorbell rang. When Ryan went to the door, he was met by his former roommate Richie Carver and his dad Larry. Terrifyingly, they were armed. He tried and failed to slam the door on them and they entered the property. Ryan was shot in the head by the men and they believed they killed him. They burst into the other room and shot Heather on the sofa. The men stole items from the house, including a computer. Worryingly, police actually believed that one of the victims in this case, Ryan, was actually the perpetrator. Ryan's parents became concerned when the pair never showed up for Christmas. They went round to check on them and rang the door and nobody answered. They called police who went round and discovered both Ryan and Heather. Unfortunately, Heather was found deceased, but Ryan miraculously was still alive. He told them he didn't remember what had happened, so police took him in and interrogated him. For some reason, they had no idea that he'd been shot in the head and needed urgent medical attention. He clearly had severe injuries to his face, but police were seemingly unaware of this for six hours. Now, Ryan had survived two gunshots to the head, but police didn't believe the story that he was giving them. Eventually, six hours later, he was rushed to hospital to receive urgent medical attention. His family were later told he was in a critical state. Doctors later told the family that he had developed an infection that could have been prevented if he'd got the hospital treatment early enough. After a lengthy hospital stay, he lost some of his brain and his eye. The attackers were given life in prison and Ryan's dad sued the police department. Ryan suffered seizures that would ultimately take his life in 2007. I totally don't mean to put a dampener on Valentine's Day, but it was on this day 11 years ago that this Olympic athlete became a killer. Oscar Pistorius was nicknamed Blade Runner due to the fact that he was a double amputee that sprinted on his prosthetic legs. In 2013, Oscar was in a relationship with 29-year-old Reva Steenkamp. She was a model and paralegal, and they'd only been dating for three months when in the early hours of the 14th of February, 2013, Oscar called emergency services from his house in Pretoria, South Africa. Reva was staying the night at Oscar's house, and he claimed that he'd woken up to hear an intruder in the bathroom. He'd shot four times through the toilet cubicle door and then broke the door down with a bat but it wasn't an intruder in there, it was Reva. Reva had suffered a fatal gunshot wound to the head and died instantly. Neighbours came forward claiming that they'd heard the couple arguing around 2am and then just an hour later they'd heard a woman screaming around the time that the shooting took place. This is Oscar at his trial demonstrating how he was walking without his prosthetics that night. He said that he jumped out of bed when he heard a noise and that he wasn't wearing his prosthetics. But it was argued that the way the gunshots were angled in the bathroom door, he would have had to have been wearing them and it wasn't like he'd just jumped out of bed in the middle of the night. 
During his trial, an ex-girlfriend also came forward saying that when they were together, he would get angry at her over the smallest thing, like not taking her plate to the kitchen after she was finished eating. She also said that he was very jealous and possessive. Police also discovered a message from Reva to Oscar in which she said that she was often scared of him. In 2014, Oscar was found guilty of culpable homicide and he was sentenced to 13 years in prison. However, just last month, after serving under 10 years, he was released on parole. The parents of Lacey Fletcher, the girl whose corpse was found melted into a maggot-ridden couch in 2022, just pled no contest to manslaughter charges, meaning they could face up to 40 years in prison. So, if you don't know this story, here are the basics, and I'm just going to warn you, this is incredibly disturbing. So this story all started in January of 2022 when Sheila and Clay Fletcher, pictured here, were arrested. That's because the authorities had recently found the rotting body of 36-year-old Lacey Fletcher, the couple's daughter, in a waste-filled crater on their couch in their home, covered in maggots and urine and feces. Lacey had been dead for an extended period of time and she had literally rotted into the couch. So, at the time that her body was discovered, Lacey Fletcher hadn't been seen out in public for about 15 years. That's a photo of Lacey up here on the top left. So, according to Lacey's parents, she suffered from a number of different ailments, including social anxiety, severe Asperger's syndrome, and a thing called locked-in syndrome, which basically means that the only muscles that you can actually move in your body are your eyes. So Lacey's parents would later go on the record and said they did their best for their daughter. They cared for her, but she just didn't want to leave the couch. And that's why they set up a portable potty next to her and brought her meals. But obviously there was a massive amount of neglect going on here because when Lacey's body was discovered, like I said before, it was covered head to toe in feces. She was in puddles of her own urine. There was mold. There were maggots in the couch. It was truly a horrific scene. A doctor who actually looked at Lacey's body as well stated that they believe that the maggots were actually inside of Lacey's body before she passed away. That means that her parents had seen that she had maggots crawling on her and inside of her and they did nothing. So now these two are facing up to 40 years in prison. I hope that their sentence really does justice in this case because this is absolutely one of the most horrific stories you'll read about. This man sobbed on TV when he found his son's dead body. Now he's been charged with his murder. Justin Lee Turner was just the sweetest five-year-old little boy from South Carolina. On the 3rd of March 1989, his dad Victor rang police. He told them that his son had got on the school bus that day and then never returned home. Justin's stepmom, Megan, said that she normally watches him get on the school bus, but on the morning in question, she was actually ill and was in the shower. She told police that she therefore didn't know for certain whether he'd got on the bus. Investigators started trying to put a timeline together. Witnesses actually reported that they'd never seen Justin get on the bus in the first place that morning. He hadn't actually attended Whitesville Elementary School at all that day. On the 5th of March, news crews were at the house capturing a search for the little boy. It was at this point that he was found dead. His body was found in a camper van by his dad, Victor. The child was said to have been strangled. His dad was filmed on TV as he wept with his head in his hands, but people could tell something wasn't quite right. Investigators felt that it was kind of obvious that he almost knew where to look for his son. He actually found him within seconds of going into the van. Police felt that he almost like acted his way through the search. It then transpired that Victor had asked some really strange questions to police. He'd asked what would happen if a family member had done harm to the victim such as killed him. However, frustratingly, there was very little evidence to go off. Police couldn't just convict him over a hunch. Now, stepmom Megan was initially actually charged in connection with Justin's death, but the case was dismissed. Tellingly, the couple moved away within weeks and Megan changed her name. Investigators reported that they never even received one single phone call from the pair about their son. They seemed to never want to get answers or justice. In 2021, the case was reviewed and old evidence was re-examined. Forensics looked into old physical evidence and new technology was able to reveal information. Fibers found in the family home matched the ones on the wounds on Justin's neck and on the clothes he was wearing. 34 years after Justin's death, his dad Victor is now charged with his murder. When you talk about disturbing human experiments, the Tuskegee syphilis study definitely has to be brought up. 
So this all starts in 1932 when poor black individuals living in Macon County, Alabama were recruited to be a part of a medical study. So these men who came from rural areas were told they had the opportunity to enroll in a program to help them treat their bad blood. This could have meant that they suffered from anything from fatigue to anemia to syphilis. It was a blanket term. These men who participated in the study were given free medical care, free burial insurance, food, and obviously payment, but what they had no idea of was that this entire thing was a sham. So the men who participated in the study weren't told that they were actually all suffering from syphilis, an STD. And they also weren't told that they were being signed up for a government study. And these experiments aimed to study untreated syphilis. So these scientists, these doctors, everybody involved with this program knew that these men were suffering from syphilis, but they didn't tell them. And even after drugs like penicillin, which were known to knock out syphilis, became widely available, they weren't prescribed or given to these men that were suffering. You see, the government was acting like they were helping these people out, when in reality they were studying their suffering. And they were allowing these men's diseases to go on for way too long. In fact, there have been over a hundred deaths linked to this study because of the untreated syphilis. Meaning that the U.S. government allowed these men to die, studied their death, and studied their pain. All while lying to them and telling them that they were actually helping them out in the first place. These disturbing human experiments actually continued up through the 1970s. And the only thing that eventually stopped them from happening was the fact that the media got a hold of this and started running it into the ground. Meaning that the government got exposed, backed into a corner, and they had to shut it down. In the 90s, though, President Bill Clinton formally apologized to the survivors from the U.S. government and gave them some awards. But still, I don't think that's enough, and this is a really disturbing footnote in American history. This is by far one of the most disturbing carnival accidents caught on camera explained. In 2014, a terrible accident occurred at an amusement park in Orlando, Florida, resulting in the death of a 14-year-old boy. The incident took place at Orlando's Icon Park, where the Freefall Ride stands as the world's tallest freestanding drop tower, towering at a height of 430 feet. The victim, Tyree Sampson from St. Louis, Missouri, slipped out of his seat during the ride. The primary cause of the accident was an operator error. The operator manually adjusted the seat restraint opening to accommodate Tyree's weight which was over 300 pounds. As a result, the restraint opening was nearly double the normal range. During the ride's descent, Tyree slipped through the gap between the seat and the harness and tragically fell to the pavement, suffering fatal injuries. The autopsy revealed that Tyree had numerous broken bones and internal injuries. His weight exceeded the ride's manual weight limit of 287 pounds. Now I'm going to explain the heartbreaking video. So if you've ever been on these rides, you know how they work. It slowly brings you up to the top and then it drops you down and then you stop kind of halfway when you get to the bottom. But as the ride slowed and came down, the momentum of it stopping threw Tyree out of his seat. And you see him being flung to the ground at a pretty fast speed. And seconds later, you hear his body hit the pavement floor. And it might be one of the most disturbing sounds you will ever hear. The best way I can describe it is the sound of a watermelon hitting the concrete from a high up distance and just exploding all over the place. You hear the disturbing splatter sounds and the bones breaking, and you also hear the sound of the blood coming back and hitting the ground after the initial hit, meaning that poor Tyree's body just exploded. The video is absolutely disturbing, and as always, I do not recommend looking it up. I just thought I'd include it to give you guys some context. But nonetheless, this heartbreaking incident highlights the importance of strict safety protocols, and proper operator training in amusement parks to prevent such tragedies in the future. This is just so sad and heartbreaking. Tyree was so young. May he rest in peace. There be a serial killer in Indianapolis. Fears in the community are growing as these two women were recently found murdered in the exact same way, days apart, and just 150 yards from each other on the same street. This is everything we know so far. On January 27th, 58-year-old Shannon Lassier was found dead outside of a dentist office on North Minifer Road in Indianapolis. According to her son, just the night before, Shannon had actually gone out for an evening walk, but she never made it back home. Police have not publicly confirmed her cause of death, but her son has come forward 
and stated that she was brutally stabbed to death. Just five days later, on February 1st, 52-year-old Marianne Weiss was also found murdered, this time behind a nearby strip mall, just 150 yards from where Shannon was found. To kind of put it in perspective, the location of where each victim was found is only about a three-minute walk from each other. Just like with Shannon, police have not publicly confirmed Marianne's cause of death but they did say that there were major similarities in these two cases, with the biggest similarity being that they were killed in the exact same manner. And with Shannon's son already confirming that she was stabbed to death and with the police's comments, I can only guess that Marianne was also stabbed to death. The other eerie similarities in these murders is the fact that they both occurred within days of each other. Both victims were white women in their 50s. Both were found between the 2100 and 2200 block of North Minifer Road, and they each had ties to the Far East Side. At the moment, Indiana police aren't sure if the two cases are connected, as there's no concrete evidence tying the two together. But they are urging the public to stay vigilant and aware of their surroundings. And they're also warning residents to travel in pairs and to not go out alone. Police haven't released much more information other than this, as they're trying to protect the investigation. So they haven't confirmed whether or not they have any suspects. But residents in the community, and especially those that live on that road, are starting to wonder if there's a possible serial killer because of how eerily similar the two cases are. And they're terrified, rightfully so. The Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department is working with a local forensics agency to see if there's any meaningful forensic evidence that can be pulled from the scene. And as part of the investigation, they're working with multiple different units. They plan to increase patrols in the area where the murders took place, in cars and on foot. And they're asking members of the community to review home security footage and to report any suspicious behavior. It might be too soon to tell if there's an actual serial killer behind these murders, but as a precaution, anyone in the area, please stay safe and only go out if you have to. Sometimes true for strange nonfiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminating in acts of cannibalism. This is the haunting last footage of Kyler Effinger, who died a few weeks ago after crawling into a plane's engine at the Salt Lake City International Airport. On January 1st, 30-year-old Kyler went to the airport to board a flight to Denver to visit his sick grandpa. But as he was checking in, there was a problem with security, which caused him to miss his flight. As you can see in the video, this caused Kyler to become really upset, and he then began using his shoe to try and break one of the airport's windows. After unsuccessfully trying to open multiple locked doors, Kyler then ran to the south end of the airport and managed to kick open a terminal's emergency exit door, which opened up to a stairwell. He's then seen running onto the tarmac as a plane is starting to take off. This all happened at around 10 p.m. that night, and as a result, a store manager inside the airport who witnessed the disturbance called the Salt Lake City Police. When authorities arrived, they were given a description of the man and began to search for him, and they eventually found some of the man's clothing and shoes on one of the airport's runways. About 10 minutes into the search, Kyler was spotted at one of the airport's de-icing pads, and he was then seen going underneath the moving plane and into its engine. The plane that was moving was on its way to San Francisco, it was flight number 2348 and it carried 95 passengers. The passengers became terrified as the plane came to a halt and as police sped down the tarmac surrounding the plane. According to some of the passengers, the pilot came on the intercom and said that there was a security event and that the man police were looking for was surrounding them. Authorities asked air traffic controllers to tell the pilot to turn off the plane's engines, but unfortunately, it was too late. Police found Kyler unconscious, partially inside one of the plane's wing-mounted engines, which, although it was turned off, it was still rotating. Authorities began CPR and administered naloxone, but sadly, Kyler was pronounced dead at the scene. And unfortunately, some passengers on the plane witnessed the entire thing. An autopsy will be conducted to determine Kyler's cause and manner of death, and the Salt Lake City Police, as well as the FAA, are still investigating the incident. But according to Kyler's family, his most likely cause of death was due to head trauma, which reportedly happened very fast. Kyler struggled with mental health for nearly a decade after being bullied all throughout school and into college, and he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when he was 20 years old. Kyler's family believes that he was suffering from a mental health episode that night stemming from missing his flight, which likely sent him into a manic episode resulting in his death. Kyler reportedly called his dad after he missed his flight and was trying to rebook. But according to his dad, just by talking to him on the phone, he knew it wasn't going to end well. He just never thought that this would be the outcome. Kyler lived in Park City, Utah, and was described as having the world's biggest heart. His parents are now wanting to try and use this horrific situation to help others struggling with mental health. These are the worst of the worst videos on the internet explained, and today we're talking about Miss Pac-Man. The video that I'm about to explain is extremely graphic and sad. Whatever you do, do not look it up. 
The video is about one minute long and it starts in a dark room and the first thing you notice is the screaming in the background. The camera then pans to the floor revealing a severed hand and it then pans to the bed which Haleandra Eco Chubb is on. The bed is soaked in blood and Haleandra has had both of her hands cut off. And at this point you can see the full extent of her injuries. Haleandra had been hit in the face so hard with the machete that she had a horizontal wound going across her face that was so deep it actually reached her ears. The wound was halfway up her face, right in the middle of her nose, and it was horizontal, hence the name of the video, Miss Pac-Man. Because the wound was so deep, it looked like an exaggerated mouth, and it looked exactly like Pac-Man. But the disturbing thing is, Haleandra is still alive at this point. At this point, you then discover the screaming in the background isn't hers, but actually someone else in the house. And according to rumors and reports, it's actually her children. The camera then pans to her face and it shows she is still aware and conscious. Her eyes move across the room in complete pain and fear. You hear her struggling to breathe due to the insane amount of blood and you hear her constantly gurgling as she tries to hang on to her life. You also hear her try to breathe but due to the injury it's extremely muffled. It almost sounds like a young baby crying. You also hear a male's voice behind the camera. Now the question is, is this the neighbors who discovered her and if so, why in the world are they recording her? Or was it her partner who was responsible for this brutal murder? The camera stays in Haleandra's face for about 30 to 40 seconds and you see her withering in pain. You hear her trying to scream and at one point the camera goes closer to her wound and you see just how deep it really is. It's literally three quarters of the way down her head. This is a very hard watch and completely disturbing. Although you don't see the awful act committed on camera, seeing the aftermath is completely traumatizing. Haleandra was sadly pronounced dead after this video was taken. This video is considered one of the worst and its brutality is compared to Funky Town. Nobody knows how this video ended up on the internet and it remains a mystery to this day. Please, whatever you do, never search for this video or picture. It's way different than a regular cartel video I explained. And it's more of a real-life horror movie, a complete living nightmare for those in the room. Rest in peace to Haleandra Eco Chubb. This is absolutely sickening, and you didn't deserve this at all. Whatever you're doing, stop scrolling. This is one of the creepiest exorcism stories you'll ever hear. Watch this. One of the worst cases I've ever heard was from The Exorcist of New York City. The woman, a young girl, Juilliard, a violinist, and she was about to graduate. She was brilliantly talented, but all of her friends were getting job offers and she had none. And her friends remember always hearing her say the words, I would do anything to be famous. Well, guess who's listening? And it wasn't long after that, that she uh, went to bed one night, had a dream. And she said in the dream was the most beautiful man she'd ever seen naked. Another sign calling card of the devil. Uh, and he said, you really want fame and power. And she said, I do. And he produced a contract and he took his finger and slashed her finger and had her sign it in her blood. And then he touched the contract and it burst into flames and the ashes fell on the floor. So pretty easy to understand what happened, right? But what's worse is her finger was cut and the ashes were next to the bed. So within a couple of weeks, she signs this multinational tour, makes a ton of money, becomes very popular and famous go on this circuit. And within a few years, she gets involved with drugs, goes to needles, gets HIV. Now she's dying in a New York hospital. And this whole thing comes back to how this started. And she calls her Filipino mother and tells her the story. And mommy calls the chancery. I need an exodus right away for my daughter. So Jim is the exodus. He shows up and they tell him the whole story from the dream forward. And he says, okay, well, that's not good. You signed a blood covenant with the devil. So I'm going to need you to break that with the blood covenant. So you're going to write out the whole creed, and then you're going to sign it in your blood. Well, the doctor's like, she has AIDS. She's not signing anything in blood. Not going to happen. And he says, well, then you need to step out of the room because she needs to do this. And she did do it. And she signed the contract, the, the creed. And she convulses and flatlines and <clears throat> dies. So now the doctor comes back and he's really upset. The mother is out of her mind. They're all blaming the priest. Hysteria goes on for about 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden she jumps up off the table. 
she's back. And they test her. No HIV, no AIDS. She's completely healed. But she then committed for the rest of her life to only do music that would honor God and to tell people about the reality of the devil and not to make deals with them. What do you think about this story? Let me know in the comments down below. These are the worst of the worst videos on the internet explained, and today we're starting with Funky Town. Before I begin, never look this video up. This is a massive trigger warning. The video begins in some sort of room and music is playing. The first song that plays is Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. And the camera pans to the victim on the floor with plastic wire. And the torture had already began before the video started. Because the victim looks like he's already been through complete brutality. His hands have already been cut off and his face has been completely flayed which means skinned. There is no skin on the victim's face at all and his eyes have been gouged out. And there is an insane amount of blood all on the floor. But the most messed up part about this is that the victim is hooked up to some sort of IV and the IV is pumping him with drugs to keep him alive. And completely aware, making sure he feels everything that is happening to him. At the start of the video, they try and slit his throat with a farming sickle and press it against his jaw. But when the victim begins to scream, they shove a box cutter in his mouth to shut him up. His screams are absolutely gut-turning. They kept going from screams to gurgling, from screams to gurgling. As the video progresses, they take the box cutter and slit his throat about 40 times. And keep in mind, the victim is still alive and aware of everything because of the drugs they are giving him to keep him alive. Also, the cartel members are mocking and laughing at the victim the entire time. They then continue to try and slit his throat with the box cutter and were going at his neck numerous times. All while the song Funky Town was playing in the background, hence the name of the video. The cartel members kept having to physically restrain the victim, meaning that there was still a lot of life left in him. And the amount of pain he had to be in is completely unimaginable. At one point in the video, a cartel member has his foot on his chest holding him down, and another time they shoved a pole in his mouth holding him in place. But the worst part about the video is towards the end where the victim manages to loosen his arms from the restraints and immediately tries to touch his face. But remember, the victim has no hands to feel, no face at all, and no eyes to see. The victim was most likely in so much shock that he likely forgot he had no hands, but instinctively the victim still tries to touch his face. It's absolutely horrifying and the video then concludes. Also keep in mind the victim was still alive when the video ended so who knows what else they did to him before he died because they were just keeping him alive to torture him. What makes Funky Town so horrifying besides what happens in the video is the mystery behind the video. We don't know the victim's name, we don't know why he was being tortured this way or what he did. The only thing that we do know is that it took place in Mexico and it's extremely horrifying to watch. You can make an argument that nobody has ever been tortured this bad in history. Funky Town is definitely one of the worst videos out there and I don't recommend watching it ever. But to start off this series, Funky Town has the first spot. Welcome campers and camp whores to the Daily Camp Hurt Week of July 25th, 2010. We have a lot to talk about, so let's get started. This anonymous web show is one of the most disturbing things that's ever existed on the internet. What I just showed you was a clip from an online program called The Daily Capper. The Daily Capper was a program put on by pedophiles all across the world. And this was the head of a community of people known as cappers. This online community of pedophiles known as cappers would go onto the profiles of underage girls and boys, flatter them with compliments, shower them with praise, and try to get them to flash them so that they could take a screen cap of their nude body. And after that, these pedophiles would then blackmail these children with these images. They would send these photos to friends, family members, schools. And there were all sorts of code words in online forums where these cappers, aka disgusting pedophiles, would meet and exchange information. The Daily Capper itself, this program, was a program put on by these pedophiles to talk about news and events that were happening within this pedophile community. It's really disturbing to me that they chose this because I used to watch the show Crash Box as a child and I think that it's eerie and haunting that they're actually using imagery from a children's show for this pedophile network. Now, sadly, one of the victims of this capping community was a girl named Amanda Todd. Amanda's story is particularly well known because of the YouTube video she created before she took her own life. But at one point during Amanda's stages of cyberbullying, she was featured repeatedly on the Daily Capper, this program. And the intro always started like this. 
welcome cappers and cam whores. And then at the end, the newscaster up here would say, happy hunting, encouraging these pedophiles to go target more children. And they would do awards at the end of the year for the best, most prolific pedophiles in their community. These awards that they gave out included Blackmailer of the Year, Capper of the Year, Cam Whore of the Year, Cam Sight of the Year, and Shocker of the Year, where they were basically giving awards to pedophiles and their victims. There's a lot of information online about this whole show and these pedophiles, but something really disturbing to me is the fact that most of the people involved in The Daily Capper were never brought to justice and they were never caught. That means that all of these pedophiles that were celebrating with each other and glorifying their disgusting acts are still out there, probably on the internet today. And to end this, I'm going to show you one more clip from the show, which I find is particularly disturbing. Candy Beaches returned this week for the first time in a month. The reason they were gone so long is because they said someone called the police on them. Twice. I think I know what this is all about. I've been reporting to the cyber police and the state police. Looks like he wasn't joking around. Maybe it was their Good Morning America interview that prompted cyber police. This woman literally devoted her whole life to her only child. She supported him, she stuck up for him when no one else would. So how did he repay her? By stealing her money and then bludgeoning her to death when she decided to confront him. Judith had become suspicious of her son Dale and she'd noted her concerns down in a diary. He'd actually received a caution from police in 2001 after embezzling money from her savings account, but she decided not to press charges. By the time 2020 came around, Dale was now in his 40s and he was still stealing money from Judith. She'd noted down in her diary things like drug addiction, lies, stealing money, referring to Dale. Towards the end of 2020, with most of Wales locked down due to COVID-19, Dale was living with Judith and this is when he did the unthinkable. It's thought that at the beginning of December, Judith had confronted Dale about his lies and stealing. He'd picked up a hammer and hit her round the head, not once, not twice, but 14 times, until she was slumped on her bed, still and silent. He'd then placed a plastic bag over her head and tied it in place with a cable. Over the next few weeks, friends of Judith became concerned that she hadn't been seen, and Dale made excuse after excuse as to why they hadn't seen her, saying that she was in hospital, visiting a friend, or self-isolating with COVID. But eventually the police were called, and they went round to Dale and Judith's in late January. They were fobbed off by Dale, saying that his mother was very ill in bed, and she was self-isolating. Less than a month later, on February 20th, the police were called again and they again visited, but this time Dale wasn't in. So they looked through a window and they saw Judith's body. She was partially decomposed, kneeling on the floor with her right arm on the bed. There was blood on the bed and a bloodied hammer on the floor. Just a few hours later, Dale actually handed himself into police. However, when questioned, he answered no comment to every single question and he refused to give up his login information for his social media accounts. When police looked into Dale and Judith's finances, they discovered that Dale had transferred money multiple times from his mother's bank account to his own, totaling £3,000. He'd then withdrawn the money in cash to fund his drug habit. He then sat night after night using those drugs, completely unfazed that his mother's decomposing body was in the next room. At Dale's trial, his cousin, Judith's niece, read out a statement that said, we'll never understand why he did this. Dale was Judith's life and the person that she loved the most. Dale pleaded guilty in August 2021 and he was sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 years and six months. Hammer, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. I have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer and cannibal. This is a true horrifying story, part 76. This story took place in Dubai very recently. There's a group of young Emirati guys that contributed money to rent a villa in a community in Dubai. They pretty much wanted to co-rent a house so they can spend time together on the weekends. So they rented this villa, they were playing games, partying, doing wrong things, bringing girls over, you know, 
stuff like that. On a normal weekend, one of these guys named Ahmed started talking to a local girl recently. After a couple of tries, he finally convinces her to come over. Before she arrived, he tells his friends not to come upstairs as he would be in one of the bedrooms with this girl. When she arrived, he immediately takes her upstairs and locks the bedroom door. In 30 minutes exactly, all the guys downstairs hear drastic screaming coming from upstairs. They see Ahmed running down the stairs, completely naked with no clothes on, scared for his life. They ask him, what is going on? He stutters in fear, saying, get out of this house, all of you. They thought he was playing some sort of prank until they see the girl run down the stairs, also with no clothes on. She was screaming with a man's voice, telling Ahmed to come back. It wasn't her normal voice, it sounded raspy and very manly. They all run outside, and one of Ahmed's friends takes his pants off and gives it to Ahmed so he can cover up. They start running and knocking on neighbors' doors in panic because calling the police will not help the situation. Maybe because there was something inside the house they didn't want the police to see. There was an Emirati neighbor nearby that allowed them to stay in his home until they figured out a solution. As they explain the story to this neighbor, Ahmed sneaks outside and sees this girl completely dressed up in her clothes, conscious and not knowing what is going on. He yells at her from a distance, saying, Stay away from me. Don't come any closer. I want nothing to do with you. She cries in pain, not knowing what she did. She asks him, Why are you standing far from me? He told her to leave. She cries and begs him to drop her home because she didn't even know where she was. This was a Ashiq jinn that possessed this girl. And this jinn did not allow another man to do the dirty with her. If someone wanted to be a hero while these things were happening, something very bad could have happened and lives could have been taken. I've just come across this story and something just doesn't sit right. This woman literally vanished into the night three years ago after arguing with her dad's girlfriend and she hasn't been seen since. Caitlin Ledbetter was born in 1995 to parents Tracy and Scott. She has an older sister and a younger brother and sister. The family lived on the outskirts of Indianapolis and it seems that in the late 90s they ran into some debt and Caitlin's mum Tracy filed for divorce. Scott moved to Tennessee and eventually Tracy stopped showing up for court proceedings and the divorce was dismissed. According to records, Caitlin's mum Tracy was arrested in 2002 for charges of battery, but there's not much info on her from then leading up to her death in 2013 when she was 38. Following their mum's death, Caitlin, then 18, and her brother Aaron, 15, went to live with their dad, Scott, in Tennessee. This is Caitlin's dad, Scott, and by 2021, Caitlin was 26. She had a boyfriend, but she was living with her dad, Scott, and his girlfriend, Crystal. According to Scott, on May 2nd, 2021, in the early hours of the morning, around 5am, Crystal and Caitlin got into an argument. Caitlin left the house through her bedroom window and she hasn't been seen since. This is where it gets a little bit strange. This was a 26 year old woman and apparently she left the house wearing nothing but a cropped pajama top and a pair of pajama shorts. She had no shoes on and she apparently fled into the woods behind the house. This is where it gets even stranger. Just three months later, emergency services were called to Scott's house. It was engulfed in flames and he said that his girlfriend Crystal was still inside. The house was completely destroyed in the fire and Crystal was found dead in the basement. According to family members, Scott didn't want to search for Caitlin at first. He only searched once. He came back and cried for 45 minutes in the house and refused to go out searching again. It apparently also took the police nine months to do a proper search for Caitlin. They used sniffer dogs in the wooded area that she'd fled into and apparently they did pick up her scent but it stopped once they got to the edge of the woods. 
Family members also said that they received messages from Caitlin's phone after she went missing around 7am that morning, but it didn't sound like they came from Caitlin. They said that she never had data on her phone, she only used the house as Wi-Fi, so those messages had to have come from inside the house. Family also noted that Scott and Crystal were heavy drug users and that Caitlin was actually a little bit afraid of her father. In fact, he'd kicked her bedroom door in the night that she disappeared, following the argument with Crystal after she'd locked herself in her bedroom. Family members are obviously still looking for answers. She's been missing nearly three years now and many of them do think that Scott was involved somehow. This is Jared Fogle, one of the worst pedophiles in American history. So if you don't know who Jared Fogle was, he was the spokesperson for Subway for a number of years. Jared initially became famous and then eventually became the spokesman of Subway because he dropped so much weight while eating a Subway diet. According to Jared, he lost almost 245 pounds while eating almost exclusively from Subway. Obviously, this was a huge story and when Subway heard about this, they contacted Jared and eventually made him the spokesman for their entire company. I swear to God, I remember this. For years, you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing this guy's face. So in 2004, when Jared was at the height of his popularity, he launched the Jared Foundation, a foundation determined to fight childhood obesity. This foundation saw Jared touring schools across the nation, talking to kids about losing weight, and yeah, just being heavily involved with children, which people at the time thought was a great thing. But it was when he was away from the cameras, behind the scenes, when Jared was engaging in some of the most deplorable behavior I've ever read about. So in 2007, a radio host and journalist from Florida came forward to the FBI and reported that Jared was saying and doing some concerning things. Apparently, while at a middle school event, Jared had been talking to her about performing lewd acts on a minor. He had texted her about all of these things, and she even recorded him saying all this stuff. At one point, apparently, Jared even asked this journalist if she could install webcams in her children's bedroom so he could watch them. Obviously, this was concerning. This journalist recorded all of this, turned it into the FBI, but they told her that they couldn't do anything because they didn't have enough evidence. And now we got to talk about Russell Taylor, a guy who was heavily involved in Jared's foundation. So when he wasn't working on the Children's Foundation, this guy, Russell Taylor, was producing CP in his home. Apparently, between the years 2011 and 2015, Russell Taylor had videotaped minors in his own home and traded photographs of them with none other than, you guessed it, Jared Vogel, King of the Footlong. According to court documents, Jared actually asked Russell if he could move some of the nanny cams in his home so he could watch children in varying states of undress or while they were naked taking a bath. Russell also claimed that Jared made him set up accounts on porn sites in his name and he wanted to basically run his whole CP operation for him. Well, shortly after Russell Taylor was arrested, Jared Fogel's home was raided and guess what they found? A ton of CP. On the same day that his home was raided, Subway severed all ties with Jared and some new disturbing facts came to light during the trial. Apparently years prior, Jared had been texting a Subway franchisee named Cindy. And over these texts, he talked about wanting to abuse kids aged nine to 16. He told Cindy she should sell herself for sex on Craigslist and even asked her to arrange a sexual meetup between him and her 16 year old cousin. Eventually, Jared pled guilty to possession of CP and traveling to conduct an illicit sexual behavior with a minor. Apparently while in New York City, he paid to have sex with a 17 year old girl. But this story isn't over yet. I'm gonna post part two and it definitely gets more interesting from here on out. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, did not act alone. This TikTok series is about to blow your mind, but there's a lot of information here, so proceed with caution. The case of John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer clown, is one of the most infamous true crime stories in American history. A brief overview of the case, in the 1970s, John Wayne Gacy murdered 33 young men he buried them in the crawl space beneath his home and his yard, and he was connected to a number of different crimes. Gacy himself gained infamy because he dressed up as Pogo the Clown on the weekends and volunteered at hospitals and children's birthday parties. Now, the official story says that John Wayne Gacy acted completely alone. He had no help in carrying out any of these murders, but I really don't believe that that's the case. Through all of our research that we did for our podcast, we've determined that Gacy was connected to a number of other killers, pedophiles across America. And he even may have been connected to one of America's other most infamous serial killers, the Candyman out of Houston, Texas. So before we get into this, I want to state that I do believe that Gacy did murder some people, and I think he was very complicit in all of this, obviously, but I don't think that he acted alone. But why do I think that? So to start off, we need to talk about Jeffrey Rignall, this guy who was actually a survivor of John Wayne Gacy. After a night of abuse and essay at the hands of John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Rignall was allowed to go free. 
But what Jeffrey would go on to tell authorities and the media about what happened that night at Gacy's home is a major thing in this whole conspiracy. Now, Jeffrey would tell the police that while Gacy was essaying him, there was another man in the room. Now, whether or not this other man participated in the essaying or they were there to watch, it doesn't matter. Someone was watching this criminal act occur. He knew he could give a description of the guy, and he knew that someone else was there watching this happen. Then we get to Robert Bob Gilroy, who was a victim of John Wayne Gacy. So Robert Gilroy was abducted on September 15th, 1977. That's the official date that he went missing. He was supposed to show up for an event after that day, but he never showed. But John Wayne Gacy's plane tickets and records placed him as being out of the state at the time. His plane tickets from the time show that Gacy left Illinois on September 12th, and he didn't return until September 16th, the day after Robert Gilroy went missing. Already, these two facts point to a larger conspiracy at hand. There may have been people helping procure victims for Gacy, and he may have been even paying for these victims. And that's when we get to Philip Paskey and John David Norman, two of the most horrific people I've ever read about. And this is where the connections with the case start to get really shocking. And we've talked about John David Norman here on my TikTok before. This guy was connected with the higher ups in the government. This guy had lots of political power and he was a known pedophile. Remember, in earlier TikToks, I even told you about how John David Norman was arrested multiple times. He had Rolodexes full of index cards of the people who he was supplying these young men to. And both times, the police departments lost the Rolodexes and lost all the names of the abusers. But how did they connect to Gacy? Well, in part two, we're going to talk about it.